I want to welcome you to this impossible workshop where we are tasked in the space of 50 minutes with the job of contemplating the spiritual dimensions of climate change. A 50 minute period during which, as the organizers of this event have requested, there be time uh, allotted for both presentation and conversation. A formidable effort to be sure, made even more challenging by virtue of the person who is leading the wor workshop, namely me, Elaine Hughes, a pastor in the Lutheran Church and so theoretically connected to things of the spirit, but also a person who lives in a beautiful home on the Bagaduce River in Sedgwick and who has at her disposal all the resources, privileges, and benefits allotted to white, upper middle class, well-educated, well-situated people in the United States of America. In other words, in terms of the massive and extreme stresses put on our environment by overuse, abuse, and consumption, I am part of the problem. And I say this at the outset so you know from the beginning that this workshop in this workshop, I will not tell you what you should do to respond to our climate catastrophe from a spiritual place because I am struggling with the same question. Rather, it is a workshop designed to help us see how looking at climate change through a spiritual lens might offer a unique perspective as we try to deal with and respond to the catastrophic environmental changes happening all around us. So while I come with some thoughts about what it might mean to use this spiritual lens for this work, I am hoping that in our conversation together we might all go away from this time better equipped for the work at hand in both the outward sense of doing and in the inward sense of being. And in order to begin exploring the idea of using this lens of spirituality as a frame through which we might look for guidance and inspiration, I invite you to look at the photograph. I hope you have one close by or in your hand. It's a photo taken by photographer Paige Eastman from Bangor. And I would like you to look at it first through the lens of development as in the kind of lens a city planners might use when choosing a possible spot for a shopping mall or such, in which case we might see the forest of trees in front of us as a problem, something to be removed. Or if we look at the photo through the lens of construction or home building, we might see board feet. Or if we look through the photo through the lens of biology, we might see a myriad of habitats for hundreds of species of plant and animal life. Or if we look at the photo through the lens of botany, we might see what some scientists are now suggesting, that being a community of trees sharing nutrients, concerns, and warnings, attuned to one another's needs and tending to one another's stresses through their root systems and leaves, and for a beautiful description of this phenomenon, I suggest reading Richard Power's book, The Understory. Or in keeping with our workshop theme, if we look at the photo through the lens of spirituality, we see something similar to what the botanists are beginning to see, but on a planetary, global, or even cosmic scale. Something very hard to put into words, but nonetheless alluded to, in the wisdom traditions of all the world's major religions, even if historically glossed over or undermined or silenced by the institutional arms of those same religions. Something we can sense in these words of Chief Seattle who said, this we know, the earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth, this we know, all things are connected, like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. 
Looking at Paige's photograph through the lens of spirituality, we learn to see beyond development, beyond board feet, beyond even botany and biology, all the way to this place where we begin to sense the interconnectedness of all things on earth and in the heavens, all of it held in a mystery some call sacred presence or great spirit or music or mercy or love or God or Allah or Yahweh or a thousand other names that came can't even be spoken of except by <gasps> looking through the lens of spirituality we learn to open ourselves to sense the interconnectedness of all things until as one 13th century mystic said we come to see that between us and the great presence called love or God or <gasps> there is no between which means between you and me and us and them, and this hand and the root system of ancient trees and your eye and the inky black feathers of a raven, there is no between. It doesn't happen overnight, this kind of seeing and sensing, because things of the spirit never do. But because of the dire envir environmental threat to our earth and to life as we know it these days, I think this widening and deepening of perspective is taking place now even in folks who haven't spent much time looking through the spiritual lens. Folks like me, for instance, who have spent much of our time looking at our world through the lens of the institutional church and not enough time looking through the lens which the mystics and artists and poets and prophets and shaman and healers have pleaded with us to look for ever so long. So what I want to suggest is that looking through the lens of spirituality shapes the way we respond to climate change and climate chaos, both in the outward sense of doing and in the inward sense of being. Both the doing and the being beginning with something we human beings don't often choose for ourselves a something of which I can best speak by sharing an old story about acorns told by Jacob Needleman in his book, Lost Christianity, a story that goes like this. Once upon a time, in a not so far away land, there was a kingdom of acorns nestled at the foot of a grand old oak tree. Since the, since the citizens of this kingdom were modern, fully westernized acorns, they went about their business with purposeful energy, and since they were midlife baby boomer acorns, they engaged in a lot of self-help courses. <laughs> there were seminars called Getting All You Can Out of Your Shell. <laughs> there were woundedness recovery groups for acorns who had been bruised from their original fall from the tree. There were spas for oiling and polishing those shells and various acornopathic therapies to enhance longevity and well-being. One day in the midst of this kingdom, there suddenly appeared a naughty little stranger apparently dropped out of the blue by a passing bird. <coughs> he was capless and dirty, making an, an immediate negative impression on his fellow acorns. And crouched beneath, beneath the oak tree, he stammered out a wild tale, pointing upward at the tree. He said, we are that. Delusional thinking, obviously, the other acorns concluded. But one of them continued to engage him in conversation. So tell us, how would we become that tree, he asked. Well, said the scruffy old acorn, it has something to do with going into the ground and cracking open the shell. Insane, they responded, totally morbid. Then we wouldn't be acorns anymore. Looking at the complexity, beauty, and exquisite interrelatedness of our world through the lens of spirituality, particularly in the present state of degradation and destruction, leads to a breaking open of our hearts our lives, our small, tight, closed up, acorn ways of being in the world. It just does because love does. Break us open, I mean, devastate us, 
crack open the shells of self-protection and self-preoccupation and apathy and fear so we might live into our fullness as human beings with all the demands and relinquishments and dying and rising and complexity and joy and sorrow such fullness brings. Think of a time when you fell in love or when you held your child for the first time. That moment when you realized your life would never again be the same. That moment when it became clear to you that this love would cost you something. That relinquishment of some old way of doing things would be required. Looking at the present state of our world through the lens of spirituality breaks us open in the same way as love leaving us exposed, raw, vulnerable, wounded even, recognizing our lives will never again be the same, recognizing that any movement in the direction of global healing will require a turning and a going in a different direction, which is the true meaning of repentance, you know, turning and going a different direction. Recognizing that any movement in the direction of global healing will require taking up certain practices. And for folks like me, even a relinquishment of privileges and conveniences to which we have grown accustomed, leaving us, me, wondering just what such relinquishment might look like. This will be one of the questions we ponder together in just a bit, the question of what practices we might take up for the healing of the world, and along with it, the relinquishment question. For those of us who, like me, aren't all that used to relinquishing much of anything and who don't much like thinking about it. These are some of the questions we will bring to our conversation in just a few minutes. And they're important questions for each of us to ponder in these days. All of them leading to the question of what we are to do as the waters rise and species disappear and mass migrations of just desperate mothers, fathers, and children leave the unsustainable livable, oft time violent places they have called home in search of food and shelter and a sense of belonging. What we are to do as both love and grief break open our hearts and lives to see the devastations being wrought upon the web of life that connects all of creation. But as, critically as important, but as critically important as this question of doing is, I think looking through the spiritual lens raises an even more important question in these days of environmental chaos. That question being, in the face of such devastation and death, who do we, who do you want to be? This is a question of being, a question whose answers look less like lists and strategies for action than like poetry, and whose meaning is rooted in a spiritual wisdom steeped in paradox. Like the paradox of the root word for the French word blessing, blessure, which can also be translated as wound as if to say blessing and wound are somehow related to one another, as if to say that somehow in the wound there might be a blessing if we go deep enough into the darkness to see light there. This is a spiritual truth that's hard to grasp or understand, and one I do not offer without some trepidation, given the untold suffering inflicted upon creation through wounds too deep and painful for words. Please know that I am not saying there are sweet blessings to be found in wounds of such things as racism, sexism, militarism, or, or classism. Nor am I saying that in the demise of our Mother Earth there are bright, shiny, sparkly, hallmark blessings to be had. 
But what I think we come to see in all spiritual paths is that being wounded, broken open, made vulnerable by the devastations of life can open us to see things we could not see when we thought we were still intact, well put together, in control, at the top of our game, independent. Acknowledging our woundedness brings us to our knees, says, say the mystics, and lead us to a place where we might actually shed our acornopathic shell-shining ways in exchange for acknowledging our need and living from that place of vulnerability in exchange for reaching out to one another, searching for meaning, longing for beauty, lifting our heads, opening our eyes, daring to sing in the dark, such a stance of openness leading us to more attentiveness to the gifts of each day, more appreciation of each moment, more willingness to take risks in the direction of service and love, more fully alive in the authentic and real, real places in ourselves, even as we relinquish our brightly polished, well put together selves giving us a glimpse of a kind of wisdom that comes clear in the children's classic, The Velveteen Rabbit, whose story is told in the book of the same name by Marjorie Williams, especially in those lines where the spiffy, brand new Velveteen Rabbit, given as a Christmas present to a small boy, finds himself thrown into the nursery after Christmas, landing alongside the old skin horse who had been a beloved toy of the boy of the house for a very long time. Lying there next to the old skin horse, the velveteen rabbit asks, what does it mean to be real? Does it mean having things that buzz inside you in a stick out handle? A question to which the old skin horse responds by saying, real isn't how you're made. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? Asks the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. But when you are real, you don't mind getting hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, asked the velveteen rabbit, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or who have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. What I want to suggest on this day when we are considering the painful realities of environmental devastation is that looking through the lens of spiritual, spirituality asks us to consider who we want to be in the face of loss and pain and death. Looking through the spiritual lens calls us to make choices about how we want to live in the midst of it all. And what I want to suggest is that we have something very important to learn about such being from the old skin horse and from the naughty little stranger apparently dropped out of the blue by a passing bird amongst his fellow acorns. We can learn how to die before we die. We can learn how to die to those things that keep us closed of heart, narrow of vision, small of soul. And like the velveteen rabbit and the acorns, we can allow ourselves to be broken open, devastated by love until we are made real, until we are the fullest measure of ourselves we can possibly be, until we can recognize the presence of the sacred in everything everyone, including ourselves. Holding on perhaps to those words by letter, Leonard Cohen. So come, my friends, be not afraid. 
We are so lightly here. It is in love that we are made. In love we disappear. These are the words of Catherine Ingram that, that the, uh, Catherine Ingram suggests we hold on to in an article she just wrote called Facing Extinction. Catherine quoting from Jonathan Franzen's latest book, The End of the Earth, who writes, even in a world of dying, new loves continue to be born. Even in a world of dying, new loves continue to be born. This is now the time to give yourself over to what you love, perhaps in new and deeper ways, Franzen continues. Your family and friends, your animal friends, the plants around you, even if that means just the little sprouts that push their way through the sidewalk in your city, the feeling of a breeze on your skin, the taste of food, the refreshment of water, or the thousands of little things that make up your world and which are your own unique treasures and pleasures. Make your moments sparkle with the experience of your own senses and direct your attention to anything that gladdens your heart. Find your community. Be grateful. Be of service. Give yourself over to love. I find it so helpful and beautiful and hopeful that Catherine Ingram, in an article about how we might be when facing the possibility of extinction, ends her essay with these words. Despite our having caused so much destruction, it is important to also consider the wide spectrum of possibilities that make up a human life. Yes, on one end of that spectrum is greed, cruelty, and ignorance. On the other end is kindness, compassion, and wisdom. We are imbued with great creativity, brilliant communication, an extraordinary appreciation of and talent for music and other forms of art. We cry in tenderness when we are touched by love, beauty, or loss. We cry in empathy for others' pain. Some of us even sacrifice our lives for strangers. There is no other known creature whose spectrum of consciousness is as wide and varied as our own. You likely know well the spectrum of human consciousness within yourself. Perhaps you have had many moments when greed or hatred overtook your mind, but it is likely you have also had many moments when you knew that love was all that ever really mattered. And in your final breaths, it is likely to be all that is left of you, a cosmic story whispered only once. As Leonard said, it is in love that we are made, in love we disappear. This is something of what we come to see, to sense, when we look through the lens of spirituality at all the devastation that is happening around us. This lens offering us a gift, I think, as we try to discern both the doing and the being of our lives. Both the doing and being, depending upon the necessity of practicing the art of caring, of attentiveness, of gratitude, of passionate rage, of dying to our small selves in order that we might rise into our fuller selves for the sake of love. Practicing the exercises by which we might become real. Just as Yo-Yo Ma said, he practiced the Bach cello suites two measures at a time. Until finally, not only could he play the music, but he became the music. It is this practicing we will talk about in just a minute, sharing thoughts and ideas about the practices we might adopt both in the doing and the being as we face the devastations of climate change. Some of those practices having to do with relinquishment, of letting go of some of the comforts and conveniences to which we have grown accustomed for the sake of the whole for the sake of the exquisite cosmic constellation of love which connects us to all of creation. What are your thoughts, your hopes, your fears? 
What are you practicing these days in both the doing and the being that moves in the direction of healing and wholeness? What are you relinquishing? I need to know this. For me, I need to know. How are you finding strength in the midst of the pain and blessing in the midst of the wound? How are you coming to die before you die? These are the questions that come to mind and heart when looking at the chaos of climate change through the lens of spirituality. And none of us can face these questions alone. So in the spirit of community and cosmic connectedness, let us take a moment of silence to center our hearts and minds in the beauty and pain of this moment before we speak. And as a prelude to this silence, I will share a little story about something that happened on November 18th, 1995, at Lincoln Center, as Isaac Perlman began a concert with the New York Philharmonic. As the story goes, just as Isaac Perlman finished the first few bars, one of the strings on his violin broke. You could hear it snap. It went off like gunfire across the room. There was no mistaking what that sound meant, what he had to do. Instead, he waited a moment, closed his eyes, and then signaled the conductor to begin again. The orchestra began, and he played from where he had left off. And he played with such passion and such power and such purity as we had never heard before. Anyone knows that it is impossible to play a symphonic work with just three strings. But that night, Isaac Perlman refused to know that. After quieting our outburst of applause in a quiet, pensive, reverent tone, he said, you know, Sometimes it is the artist's task to find out how much music you can make with what you have left. I am going to ring the prayer ball and I would like us to take a moment of silence after which we will have some sharing. So in the time we have left, it really is a time of open space for sorrows, impressions, fears, hopes, practices. What are you practicing? I want to know what might relinquishment look like for those of us who, like me, have all the privileges and comforts that are imaginable thoughts, inspirations, fears, yes, and maybe stand up and speak aloud so everyone can hear.
Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, over here. What we have is worth really uh, taking advantage of to the extent that we can and, um, and taking delight in presence. Uh, just that I want to tell a very silly little story in a way, but um, a couple of mornings ago, I woke up pretty early, walked to the window, looked down, and there in this early sunlight coming in was a, a doe, a beautiful medium-sized very reddish brown, short coated deer. And it was browsing on everything. I mean, on the lily leaves and then the blackberry leaves and then some cherry leaves from the tree. It was totally indiscriminate, it seemed, in what it you know, was enjoying eating. And then I noticed there was a Phoebe flitting around all over it and around it that uh, was, um, you know, eating the insects that were being stirred up by the movement of the, uh, uh, the deer. And not only that, it was landing on the deer frequently, you know, on its back, on its head, you know, and then would jump off and get something and come back and pick something off the deer and then come back. Um, and the deer was obviously very happy to have the Phoebe around. It was like, you know, a rhinoceros bird or something that's uh, eating the insects on it. I'd never seen this before. Uh, and I was, uh, just, you know, standing there gawking and smiling. And, uh, and then I went away and 20, you know, 20 minutes later I came back and the deer was in another part of the, the yard. The Phoebe was still there, following it all around, eating all these insects. I don't know what it was doing. How could it eat all those insects? But um, the thing that struck me about that was um, even when we're appreciative and trying to be present, uh, and it's often in a rather abstract way, what makes the difference is staying there you know we say oh there's a woodpecker and we go do something else instead of watching the behavior of the woodpecker for 15 20 minutes um, or watching what the um, you know uh, the porcupine is doing up on the oak tree where it's been stripping the bark now for two years uh, and how it moves and, and uh, the relationship between um, you know the animal and the tree. I mean, I just find that the longer we take, the less we feel inhibited by the factor of time in our life, um, the more this all means at this moment. And, you know, as we're in a, uh, you know, even as the earth is greatly diminished, it still is giving us and giving and giving to us, you know, great beauty and great knowledge. Um, that's the relationship I, I want to cultivate, uh, no matter what happens next. Um, I'm from Quebec, so sorry for my accent, but uh, um, um, I just want to speak as a young one who had been touched and opened his, her heart uh, to spirituality, to transformation, that it's really possible to transform ourselves. Like I was, I had been traveling the world I've been inspired by so many people and deep down like what we really need is so little like it's it's we can so much let go of a lot because what fills us the most is in such a simplicity and it's so much everywhere and it's so free <laughs> that we can do this leap of faith of just going towards this heartfelt truth that we have, falling more and more in love with the earth, with our mother earth, with uh, humanity, with life, and just trust. Because surrendering to the pulse of evolution, the, 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 the evolution pulsion, it's guiding us. And so I just want to share um, this love for life, this love for earth, this call of the possible that we're in front of because w of course there is the possibility of uh, this doomsday and everything it's a possibility but there's also a possibility of an amazing greatness of the shine of human beings 
of the transformation of the call of possibility is infinite and so this also can feed us and yes thank you very much <laughs> i can't think of a better note to go out on thank you all for being here yeah.